Hello and welcome to The Exchange. Today we're discussing sexualization of children. Should parents be concerned about padded bras for nine-year-olds, music videos and slogan t-shirts? What do parents do to protect their children's innocence? Who should take responsibility? We'll try to find out how to balance the need to educate and protect and how to be responsible as a society. What are kids concerned with these days? Getting good grades? enjoying their favourite sport? Or are they more worried about what they look like? When children turn on the TV, they see their favourite celebrities and want to be just like them, influencing how they dress and act. Is this something parents should ignore? How can parents protect children from a culture that's highly sexual? Today we're joined by Dr Emma Rush, who is a lecturer in philosophy and ethics and is recognised nationally for her research on sexualisation of children. Emma is the lead author on two papers on this topic, which led to a Senate inquiry into the issue. Welcome, Emma. Thanks so much for having me. Sharon Witt is an educator, author and speaker who has worked with thousands of young Australians. Sharon has been a secondary teacher for nearly 20 years and has authored 11 books for the young and regularly runs workshops and parenting seminars in schools. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you for having me. Well, it's a fascinating topic today, and Emma, I'm glad you're well uh, written and researched uh, on this. Just to clarify, right at the beginning of the program, when we're talking about the sexualisation of children, are we referring to a particular age? Oh, no, we can refer right down to babies, actually. So in terms of the culture... Wow, that is culture, incredible. That's, yeah. that's new information for me. Yeah, it's, it's kind of shocking. So uh, a couple of years ago, uh, Cotton On produced little jumpsuits for babies that said things like, I'm a tits man, and, uh, you know, mm. my parents just wanted a good night out, that kind of thing, which is just... Really yeah, inappropriate. It's grading, isn't it? It's really inappropriate. inappropriate. They actually also that you can also buy um, sort of high-heeled booties for babies. Yeah. Same kind of thing. Quite yeah. incredible. If you have a look at the screens right now, actually, you'll see some of the things that you're uh, that you're talking about there. Referring to. Right. So there's. Yeah. Yeah, there's little kids there that um, you know look more like teenagers, and you know not exactly building sandcastles and eating ice creams, are they? Right. So adolescence starts very young. The concerns with things that we used to think were adolescent preoccupations, like how one looks and fitting a certain image, begin very, very young these days. So the problem always existed, Sharon. Look, I don't remember it being quite so um, in your face when I was growing up and certainly when I was in high school. I think um, especially our young people today are just bombarded with sexualised images on a daily basis. You know, you just mentioned before some of the, the clothing for young, young children. Uh, in fact, there's been other... Uh, uh, stores that have actually promoted um, pornography on their on their mugs, on their back to school pencil cases, you name it. Pornography is in our children's faces these days. And you know, um, a wonderful person, Melinda Tankard Rice, says the standard you walk by is the standard that's set. And I think as 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 parents, you know, we really owe it to our children to stand up and to say enough is enough. And is it more directed towards? Boys or girls? Is it one gender that it's more directed towards? It's more directed towards girls, but boys also are affected by it. So, and, and it is kind of gendered as well. So with girls it's more about how you look, but with boys it's often a bit more aggression focused. Mm. Yeah. And I think it's also good to add that, you know, whilst it is directed mainly at girls, it's the boys that it affects as well, because if they're seeing this, you know, these um, sexualised images of, of what a young girl should look like and how she should act and dress, that's what they're expecting. And so they're really being affected by these images that they're seeing. So when they're young adolescents and they've, you know, all they see is this pornography and they see the, the music video clips with, with people prancing around in, in next to nothing, mm. and then they get girlfriends and think, well, OK, how, how are you supposed to dress how you're supposed to act this is the standard that they're used to seeing yeah and I mean some of these images that we're seeing that we've just seen um, you know they, they're so provocative these are 10 year old kids well what we just saw there was a 15 year old so mid-teens you think yeah. we've got a 15 year old daughter yeah. and uh, I would not want to see her looking like that or dress like that. Definitely not. Absolutely. A classic example is Miley Cyrus. I remember my daughter who loved Hannah Montana oh, yes. when she was sort of 10, 11. It's my daughter. And then the next thing, you know, Miley Cyrus becomes a pole dancing, um, yeah. wearing next to nothing, 
you know, and has changed her image completely. And so a lot of the role models that our young children are looking at are changing their images and, you know, it, it leaves them with mixed messages. Yeah, I'm interested in that, though, because I, just talking to my, our own daughters about that, mm -hmm. they grew up with Hannah Montana, love that whole thing, you know, the whole Disney thing and everything. But now Miley's turned in that way. Mm -hmm. They actually don't want to listen to her anymore. In fact, they, you know, comes on the radio and they kind of roll their eyes and go, what a, what a disappointment that she's... So it can also work you know, yeah. in, in their favour, I think, you know, when they see a bad role model. Emma? Right. So my daughter's the same now. Miley Cyrus has dropped her standards. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, that's good. It's good that kids are able to make those judgments sometimes. Is this something that's limited to the Western world? Is this more of a problem in our culture, you say, than other, than other nations? All cultures are different. I think the reason that it's sort of starting now in the West is there's kind of threefold. One is that they discovered back in the 1980s that products that children were exposed to as children, they tended to buy into adult life. So some, of, some products like bras and cosmetics and stuff are now being sold in baby versions to children mm. to keep them purchasing through the age cycle, which is an issue. But they're also kind of, with the internet, there's much less separation between childhood culture and adult culture. So everything is just a click of a button away. Yep. Um, and so that I think children are much less insulated from the broader cultures than they were once. And the other thing which is kind of attached to that, to the extent that uh, pornography is now much more available. What there is there is apparently um, much less, sort of much more aggressive and nasty than it was, say, 30 or 40 years ago. And that's to do with desensitisation of the adult consumer, yep. apparently. And so it's, it's really a very different complex of stuff that children are being exposed to now than they were 20 years ago. There's no doubt that it's different. And yep. there's that really awkward, if, you're, if your child is, uh, we, have, we have girls, and if they're big enough to fit into adult clothes, but yet not, you know, it's not what you want for them, or they even want, it's so hard to find something that is, that is actually appropriate. And the marketing, as you say, is aggressive. Right. Yeah. There's whole, that whole rise of the kids getting older, younger, and, you know, I, I have a 13-year-old girl and, you know, there's certain dress codes that she has with, within school and you try getting a pair of shorts that are appropriate for a 13-year-old girl to wear that are not showing just about everything. And it's really difficult and I think it's important for us as parents and uh, is to stand up and, and to actually say to the marketers and to say to the stores, this is not OK. This is not OK for you to promote these things for our, our children. So true. You just mentioned a 13-year-old go girl and if you look at the monitors right now, you'll see a 13-year-old. You've got to be kidding me, 13 uh, years she old. She is 13 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, does this affect their development? in any way, like when children are forced into older life? We're seeing a, a shift in what children are concerned about at younger and younger ages. So it's now um, very well recognised, there's been plenty of psychological research that children as young as six and seven are very concerned about their body shape. And so they all want to be thin and muscular, both boys and girls. And, and that's very the young. Girls are talking about their thighs mm. from no size. It's so sad. That's so sad. And you're so saying that boys, it's equal. The boys as well are concerned about more. They are to, they want to be more muscular, but of course you can't be muscular as a boy until you've hit adolescence. It's that's completely exactly right. unrealistic. So I had a grade six teacher saying to me when she talked about sexualisation to her class before coming to talk to me, the boys said, "Oh, miss, miss, it affects us too." One of them said, "I want to be buff." Yeah, and how old I want to have a six pack. pack. 11. This is ridiculous. Yeah. And Maggie Hamilton, who did some research in Sydney with um, teenagers, found that boys were now going to the beach and not wanting to take their T-shirts off. I mean, this is crazy. So it's certainly affecting children and, and what they do, the way they live their lives. We're all supposed to look like um, the people on, uh, you know, fitness magazines or, or whatever the case. And so few, I mean, there's so few of us do. Right, you know. and it pushes this whole yeah. interest in steroids, which we're seeing more among young men too. I mean, there's a reason that steroids are illegal, but obviously the use is increasing, and that yep. has a whole heap of dangerous spin-off yeah. effects. Mm -hmm. Is it getting worse? I think it's becoming more kind of embedded in society. So if you think about a child who grew up 20 years ago, they might have hit this kind of thing in their teenage years. Now they hit it at age six or seven. So mm -hmm. what... The, the way they're entering their teenage years, there's already a foundation there for a whole lot of anxiety that wasn't there in the past. So in a sense, it's, there's very little space now for children to just be themselves mm. and be comfortable being themselves. There's a sense that the eyes of the world are on them very early. Yeah. Yeah. Such mm. a shame, isn't it? Like, mm. I remember as a child, you, you were allowed to be a child. Mm. Yeah. And, and yes. things I didn't know about till I was 16 or 17 or 18. And yet you, kids today... 
Oh, as young as eight. I mean, they're oh, doing no. sex education in schools at eight years old. It's really sad. It's almost like our children's childhood has been cut by a few years. You yeah, know, definitely. the things that they're going through in grade three and grade four are things that, like you said, you know, we would go through in year eight and year nine and, and later in high school. And they're worried about boyfriends and girlfriends and, and how do I look? And, and, and once again, you know, their body shape as it changes. I do a lot of work with young girls and talking to them about the changes that go through puberty. And so many of our young girls think they're fat um, as soon as their body starts to change. And that is all tied in with this sexualisation of yeah. our young people because that's and what they're seeing. So much of what we see has been photoshopped and is not even Absolutely. real. Now, we need to take a break, but we'll be back with Street Talk and more right after this. How do you think children can be protected from a culture that is highly sexual? I think it's really up to the parents to make sure that they are safe and, and secure. I think it's difficult these days because it's everywhere. I think by training and teaching, teaching them the right thing. Um, it's quite hard to say really. Like, um, in the UK, sex education stuff starts really young, but whether that's the best way to go about it, I'm not sure, just because it's exposing them to a lot more at a young age. There are elements of dangerous sexuality in the community. It goes back to values. There's there's probably a lot of ways, uh, like I suppose, more strict monitoring on, on gaming uh, and also on um, the internet. We can add our voice to it and watch what they read and see and discuss it with them, I think. I suppose it's just up to parents to decide what's appropriate for their child and to keep a really close eye on what's going on in their child's world. Who do you think's responsible, ultimately? Um, there's a lot of advertising that doesn't help anything. I think the internet plays a big part. There's a lot of... Um, access to any sort of information on the internet, so... Their parents, <laughs> yeah. Uh, probably parents of, of children and also um, schools and, and places like... The media obviously is a major, has a major part to play, um, but I think it, it really needs to come from families and, and from those open conversations that families can have. Oh, well, as a society we're all responsible, but parents are responsible for helping their children walk that path through the world that we live in, I suppose. So parents, definitely parents first. I don't think it should have to lie with the parents, but I think, you know, without a huge change in, in culture and community, that's the only way to control it. Parents, mm -hmm. definitely, family, yeah. Yeah. Welcome back. We're discussing sexualisation of children with Dr Emma Rush and Teen Talk International's Sharon Witt. And Sandra, our Street Talk reporter, joins us now. Hi, Sandra. Hi, how are you Sandra. going? Sandra. That was uh, some interesting feedback there from people out on the streets. What really stood out to you in those, in those statements? I think one thing particularly, and that's whose responsibility it lies upon, and that seems to be parents and family. And while I kind of agree with that, I kind of wonder and would like to question both of you, um, is it solely um, parents' responsibility or do we have a larger responsibility to try and change uh, corporate, you know, corporates, media, all sorts of things mm, that influence it? Absolutely. It's Ultimately, it becomes the parents' responsibility if nobody else takes that responsibility first. But in the past, it wasn't parents' responsibility because media didn't do this and corporations didn't do this. So I think it needs to stop where it starts in terms of prevention being better than cure. But in the meantime, there's no doubt that parents have to get involved. But, but surely there must be parents heading up these corporations. I mean, don't they use their heads? Yeah, I think it's really important that people actually speak up and it doesn't necessarily have to be parents, it can be anyone, anyone who's offended and thinks this is not the standard I want for my children. Mm -hmm. In fact, I've actually had um, students and ex-students who've actually signed petitions and have actually written away to companies because they've thought, OK, I'm not, I'm not happy with this. But it's often um, not brought out in the open and people kind of, it, it just flies under the radar a and little is bit. is that because we're so busy? Like in, in a busy society, do we take the time to say, this is not acceptable. 
Well, I think that that's partly the case. I remember going into a department store with my young daughter and she brought out these little bra tops, little crop tops that had been made for two-year-olds. And I, I remember I was going to go and say something, but it was the last one that was there. And when I actually use that when I go and do talks to parents, they're outraged that something could have even been on the shelves, yet they're on the shelves and they're only pulled when people make a public outcry. And there are some wonderful people out there that lead campaigns, but it's about people, they see something, actually saying this is not OK. Um, I was in, a, in McDonald's recently and there was a very scantily clad Beyonce video clip being played at 10 o'clock in the morning on the screen for everyone to see and there was parents with their children having their morning breakfast and I thought is there anyone else here noticing that there's pornography right in front of our children's faces? So are parents noticing? Well or that's the thing, no one around me even had a second no glance. I think that's the problem. Yeah. You might be busy but the point is you can't complain about everything. Mm. So when it's everywhere, like people just run out of energy. Mm. And it really I think comes back to um, what you were saying earlier about there being a change in culture around it, a change in awareness and culture about what it is to have a healthy environment for a child. So I think it does take a village to raise a child and that mm -hmm. means the media, it means the corporations, it means the McDonald's who are playing Beyonce because a lot of what's going on is stuff that's not pitched at children, it's actually pitched at a late teen and adult market but it's just slathered there for everybody. Yeah. So it's about being more conscious about who's around at the time mm. and that kind of thing. What about when it's parents that are actually promoting the sexualisation of children? I'm thinking, for example, uh, of beauty pageants mm. with, you know, two, three, four-year-olds. In fact, we've got some Having photos that we can bring up hands. right now. Uh, if you have a look at the screens. I mean, and, look, and that's like a Barbie doll. Absolutely. Yeah, <sighs> and I don't know how old she is, but she's probably about three, yeah. you know. So what, about, what would you say to a parent who's doing this to their kids and and, and saying that this is all wonderful Just and all incredible. amazing. I mean, they're ghastly. I mean, you actually see some vision of, of young children saying, I don't want to do this, mummy, or, you know, the eyelashes hurt and pulling their hair, and it is waxing really... Of waxing two and three-year-olds. Yeah, and it's really, really sad because these young children, what hope do they have if, if this is what they're being exposed to at that age? You know, this is... And this lets them know that their currency is their body. It's, yeah. you know, their currency is their body their image, looks. how they look. And we want to raise our young girls to, to understand that their inherent self-worth is in the things that they are great at, their gifts and their talents and their ability their to be a great yeah. friend. Sense of humour. Absolutely not in how they look and how they act. But ultimately to lead the change in this it does require parents, yeah. society to do, a, to be outraged yeah, absolutely. And, and, and to and speak up. And are our voices heard Emma? Uh, do the corporates listen? Sometimes. Sometimes, but it's reactive rather than proactive. So um, mm. Bonds, for example, did pull the, the size six and size eight sort of mini bras. Yeah. Um, there were a number of service stations who pulled category one porn magazines off the shelves and put the other ones behind the counter so that they weren't in front of children's eyes. So, and that was on because parents stood up and, and said, this has to change. But it's a lot of work for parents if you're fighting every battle one at a time. We so really true. need a cultural-wide change yeah. about that. And I, think, I actually think politicians could help. Um, regulation would be helpful but would be difficult to implement but politicians could make it clear that this is not right yeah. we don't mm -hmm. appreciate this so there's something to be said the British Prime Minister uh, once said something about exhortation rather than regulation we could do with a bit of that in Australia yeah. with people who are leaders in society standing up and saying this is not okay yeah, mm -hmm. well said Sandra thank you for popping in great to be here always good and we'll be back with more on the exchange right after this Welcome back. We're chatting with Dr Emma Rush and Sharon Witt about the sexualisation of children. Just before the break, Emma, you mentioned that you'd written a paper, you talked about uh, influencing government. Now, you wrote a paper that uh, actually forced a, a Senate inquiry, I believe. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, ultimately it prompted a Senate inquiry because there was so much public discussion about the issues. And the Senate inquiry you know, was open, took many, many submissions uh, and in the end recommended a number of things. One was that the Advertising Standards Board had to be tougher on billboards because parents can't prevent their children seeing billboards. And I think there has been some improvement there, although I think more could still be done. 
it recommended more research into the issue. So it said to the National Health and Medical Research Council, we want a longitudinal study into the impacts of premature sexualisation on our children. That actually died because the National Health and Medical Research Council said we can't do that kind of research. It's actually very difficult because there are so many influences that it's difficult to measure. It's very hard to know what's causing what. So I think I actually think there's enough research around now that we could, we've got the basis to act more strongly on it. There were also um, some recommendations to the uh, state governments to consider comprehensive sex and relationships education. I don't know where that's up to, okay. um, but I know that's a very complex issue about when you raise that in schools and, you know, of course the school community has to be happy with it, it has to be very, very sensitively done. Um, and then there was another um, recommendation generally to the advertising industry and the regulators to say, tidy up your game and, and we're going to review in 18 months time. The review never happened. What a shame. And did they it's tidy up the game in the meantime? Minimally. Minimally. So mm. I think they've kind of done enough to say we did something, right. but really not enough that any, your average child or parent would notice a difference. And of course what we need is to notice a difference. Yeah. So that was very mm. disappointing. So maybe a groundswell needs to happen all over again now to say, hey, come yeah. on, you promised, now we yeah. need to see this delivered. The review needs to happen because what the review would find is that industry has done the minimum and government actually needs to step in more strongly. Yeah, and I think, I mean, that's, that's the issue. As parents, you feel totally overwhelmed by all of this. I mean, what would your recommendation be, uh, you know, Sharon, what would your recommendation be to parents who are feeling, where do we start with all of this? Yeah, absolutely, and I've had parents say to me, how do you go back? How do you go backwards if, you know? And I think the important thing is to make sure our, our young people are resourced um, as far as helping them to um, and invest time in things that don't focus on how they look. And so make sure that, you know, they're invested in some, in some great activities, but also limit and be careful about what they watch and what they see and the movies they, t they kind of watch. Because I know that there are many parents now that just sort of say, oh, well, it doesn't really matter. And there are young people watching more and more things that are explicit that we probably wouldn't have viewed when we were teenagers. So I think it's up to us as parents to set the boundaries and not be afraid to reinforce those boundaries. We only have them as children for such a short time. I think it's important for us to be very careful and mindful of what we expose them to. Where would you say that it, um, as a mother of, of girls, where is that age that you would say when they're moving into womanhood, where they want things a little bit more feminine, a little bit more, what age would that be? Are we talking 15, 16? Because certainly 12, 13 is, is far too young to you know, to be starting on some of those, but when they're starting to move in, what, what age would you say? Yeah, well, I teach teenagers, so I, I have students in those first few years of high school, and certainly I'm finding many of them coming into high school already far more down the track than I would have expected them to be because if they've got older siblings too, they're exposed to a lot more a lot earlier. Um, but I'd be thinking sort of range 15, 16 is, is when you want to sort of allow them to be exposed, I guess, to a little bit more. But we want to try and keep them as young as we can for as long as possible. And I think, you know, it's important to make sure that they've got resources that are, are available to keep them a bit more younger and I guess naive in a way if you can try and halt that. Well and I think it's important to think about it not just in terms of keeping them younger but in terms of, of actually allowing them to engage with all those other other aspects of life to lay a good sort of foundation for their adulthood rather than getting too focused on this teenage traditional mm. teenage stuff too young because they miss out on other opportunities. So when we think keeping them young, it's it's actually less about limit, limiting them than allowing them to expand through the full range of kind of human development because these are really precious developmental mm. years. Yeah. Mm. Someone mentioned earlier it takes a village to raise a child and I certainly agree with that. What What, what is the uh, role, if you like, of role models, say, you know, young girls in their early to mid-twenties that do dress appropriately and present appropriately, how powerful a role model uh, for, for young girls or young boys? I think that can be very, very powerful. So I um, am involved with a dance school in my local area, which is just fantastic. Like the girls, they're so wonderful. They so look after the younger girls. The young ones look after the big ones. And they're, you know, dancing I think is often considered a bit, of, could be a bit problematic because of the costumes and stuff. And but I think if it's image. done well, it's fantastic for girls. And that's really great because it is that cross age thing, which we don't get much. Kids mm. seem to be quite kind of cloistered in age groups. And that's actually quite unhelpful because we all benefit, yep. I think, from a role model, especially at those younger ages. Mm. And your mum, you know, she's a bit too far away. You need somebody closer to your own age. Yeah. Yes. Yeah.
Very good. A couple of things just in closing. First of all, if someone wants to complain, where do they complain? Um, they go to the Advertising Standards Bureau or they can go to ACMA, which is the Australian Communications and Media Authority. Okay. Um, and if if you go to ACMA, then there'll be a web page where you, you know it'll direct you to the right, right place. And we'll to put complain. all those on our mm -hmm. fact sheet as well. Yep. And Sharon, you got some books. In fact, quite a lot of books. Yes, um, I particularly um, have written a couple of books um, called Girl Wise, which are out in the Australian market and the UK, and they're actually aimed at, at, at young girls from age six to twelve. So encourage them to be themselves, finding out their gifts and talents, things that they love to do for themselves, how to be a good friend, how to make friendships, and um, they're really trying to help. Um, I guess combat some of those things that we we'll, talked about. We'll link to those on our fact sheet as Fantastic. well. Uh, Emma and Sharon, thank you so much for your thank time. You. Thank and you. thank you for watching. Please go to our website for a fact sheet as well as more information about our show. And I hope you can join us next time. Bye for now.